Hello, Dr. Debbie Morris here uh, for our Methodist University PA Program Neurology course. And today we're going to talk about seizures and epilepsy or seizure disorders. This is an important topic in neurology because many neurologic conditions can manifest with seizures and there are a lot of patients in primary care who you may end up seeing who have seizure disorders so you need to understand some of the causes um, and a, a little bit about treatment. These are the topics that we're going to be covering today but I want to start with some definitions. These are terms you've heard in the past and that you've probably used in the past, but it is important to understand the difference between seizure and epilepsy. So a seizure is a transient, time-limited disturbance of brain function, cerebral function, that's caused by abnormal electrical activity. So in, here it says an abnormal neuronal discharge. And the point here is that a seizure is an episode, it's an acute manifestation of some underlying condition, which may or may not be epilepsy. There are many things that can cause seizures, um, and there are many things that can cause epilepsy, which is not a single condition, but a fairly large group of disorders that are characterized by recurrent episodes of transient disturbances of cerebral function caused by an abnormal neuronal discharge, so recurrent seizures. And epilepsy is by definition a chronic condition. Um, these seizures are a fairly common cause of episodes of loss of consciousness that are unexplained. And um, it's one of the things that you need to consider when you see somebody who has had a loss of consciousness that is unexplained. Status epilepticus is a um, condition in which seizure activity persists for long enough to cause potential problems. It says here greater than 30 minutes of seizure activity. I do think that the threshold is shorter and we'll cover that a little bit later in this lecture. Um, or back-to-back -back seizure activity without a return to baseline. So when somebody has repeated seizures and never gets back to their normal baseline neurologic function between seizures, um, for more than a certain period of time. That is defined as status epilepticus. We call, uh, so we, we will define epilepsy um, as a condition in somebody who has had two unprovoked seizures. When there is um, clinical and electrical uh, physiological evidence of recurrent seizure activity, we um, make that um, diagnosis of epilepsy. Now, there are many potential causes of, of seizures and many potential causes of epilepsy. However, most of the time, almost three quarters of the time, we can't pin down a cause of epilepsy and we call that idiopathic epilepsy. However, in addition to this large group of people whose, whose epilepsy is unexplained, there are people who have acquired epilepsy as a result of trauma or tumor or brain surgery or infection or inflammation. Sorry, we'll go back to that slide. Um, there, uh, drugs, toxic disorders, um, metabolic disorders, lots of potential causes of epilepsy. There are congenital causes of epilepsy. There are inherited or genetic causes of epilepsy. Um, withdrawal of drugs and alcohol can cause seizures, um, but 
epilepsy, as we said, is recurrent seizures. So theoretically, recurrent seizures could occur with withdrawal. Um, this um, picture shows many of the possible um, causes of tumors in epilepsy. Now, if we take epilepsy, uh, you know, I, I remember saying in physiology that, that we like to split things in twos, and here's one of those times that we do that. Um, but it helps us to kind of classify different kinds of seizures. So some seizures are called focal seizures or partial seizures and do not affect the entire uh, brain, the entire cerebrum. And some seizures are generalized seizures or do affect um, the entire brain, uh, both sides and without focal um, symptoms. Within the classification of partial seizures, we have simple partial seizures, complex partial seizures, and then partial seizures that generalize and therefore become secondary generalized seizures. Within the generalized seizure category, we have a number of types of seizures that we, we are going to describe as we go through this lecture. In order to make the diagnosis of epilepsy, we need to do, take a good history, do a good physical exam. Um, in some cases, we will observe the actual seizure activity. We may do additional testing looking for things like metabolic disorders. A lumbar puncture can be helpful. An EEG, which is a uh, electrophysiologic test in which we look at brain um, electrical activity from the surface of the scalp. And then imaging, uh, when indicated, to rule out structural causes, traumatic causes, space occupying lesions, and so forth. Um, in terms of making the diagnosis of a generalized seizure, it is very helpful, well, or of a partial seizure, it is very helpful to know first if the patient can tell that the seizure is coming on. There is something called aura, and many partial seizures are um, preceded by a brief period of time in which the patient becomes aware that they are about to have a seizure and then a post-ictal state. So many generalized seizures, and particularly what we call tonic-clonic seizures, are followed by a period of time of recovery in which it takes some minutes for the patient to return to their normal neurological status. Um, again, there's a good osmosis video. I would like you to watch this video in the PowerPoint. I'm not going to include it in this. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly long one, but it's very helpful. So let's talk about some of those different types of seizures, starting with focal seizures, partial seizures. Um, so there are simple partial seizures, which are also called focal seizures with retained awareness. And these are seizures in which there is a disturbance of a specific part of the brain that can result in a motor disturbance, abnormal movements, or in an autonomic disturbance or in certain manifestations that are called psychic manifestations, like hallucinations, memory problems, a sense of deja vu, um, erotic thoughts. Um, so in focal seizures with retained awareness or simple partial seizures, patients remain aware. 
they know something abnormal is happening, they will remember afterwards that something is happening, depending on the part of the brain that is involved. They may have somatosensory manifestations, like a brief period of tingling. If the um, sensory cortex is involved, they can have focal motor symptoms like tonic or clonic or tonic clonic movements of an upper or lower extremity or their face or their head and eyes. They can have autonomic involvement in which they change skin color, get sweating, get weird stomach sensations. Um, the hallucinations can be auditory or visual. Um, and on EEG, we would identify abnormal electrical activity only in the part of the brain that is having these abnormal electrical impulses. In this uh, particular little EEG, which you would certainly never be expected to interpret, the part of the brain that is affected is right uh, motor cortex affecting the left arm and hand. There's something called a Jacksonian march in partial seizures in which the abnormal activity starts in a small area, say a finger begins an um, abnormal movement, twitching, and then it extends to the hand and then to the arm. So the Jacksonian march is this abnormal electrical activity spreading up across a part of the cortex, um, and specifically motor cortex, uh, uh, causing this um, kind of growth in the, in the uh, area that is experiencing the abnormal movements. Um, after a seizure, and this tends to be more likely with generalized seizures. During the postictal state, there is something called Todd paralysis in which people may continue to have a focal neurological deficit like hemiparesis that persists for minutes to a day or so. Um, this is, whoops, I was hoping here, I think maybe I can make this one go. Hey, Mitchie, you got to stand back, okay? Hear it. Come here. Come here. Honey? So you okay. hear a lot of background noise, yeah. but, but this he's is definitely a child right. having a focal motor. Okay, honey. It's okay. Right. It's okay. It's okay. I know. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. 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 Um, so that was a focal seizure with retained awareness or retained consciousness. But then there are focal seizures with impaired awareness, which are also called complex partial seizures. These days, focal seizures with impaired awareness. Um, and they are uh, sometimes involve the temporal, frequently involve the temporal lobe, um, sometimes the medial frontal lobes. These folks often have an aura, sometimes a sensation of um, epigastric discomfort, sometimes hallucinations, deja vu or fear. So they know that the seizure is coming on and then they may have um, kind of a blank, vacant stare. They may have um, some abnormal movements like chewing or picking at clothing. Um, the seizure, that, but, but consciousness is impaired. And hallucinations are common with temporal lobe epilepsy and focal seizures with impaired awareness. These seizures last one to three minutes. Most often, as I said, the muscle activity is um, around the, the face and mouth. And um, 
by definition, consciousness or responsiveness during the, sur the, the seizure or memory of the seizure are impaired. So unlike um, focal seizures with retained awareness in which the patient is very aware of what's happening and remembers it, in focal seizures with impaired awareness, um, they may very well, they are unlikely to remember it because of uh, consciousness having been impaired. And there is a, another video. And you notice this aut automatism where the child is kind of staring blankly as she picks at her clothing. And you, if you didn't know she had a seizure disorder, you might not realize that this motor activity um, and blank stare are part of a focal seizure with impaired awareness. Okay. Now we're going to move from focal seizures into generalized seizures. And the kind of seizure that most people think of when they think of seizures and when they think of epilepsy are generalized seizures, which we call, um, in the most common case, tonic-clonic seizures. So what we now call a generalized tonic-clonic seizure used to be called a grand mal seizure. They have um, not the sorts of auras or psychic uh, manifestations of the focal seizures, but sometimes they, they, they just don't feel good and know a seizure is coming on. They then lose consciousness um, may fall to the ground. In the tonic phase, that fall might be backwards uh, with that tonic limb contraction. Um, there can be tongue biting. Um, and then this clonic phase where muscles contract and relax. The seizures usually last for a couple minutes during the seizure. The breathing may be disturbed, um, and then the seizure ends. Uh, the patient may have been incontinent of urine, often is incontinent of urine during this type of seizure, and they emerge from the seizure a little bit confused and drowsy, maybe with a headache, and have this post-ictal period of minutes, half an hour, um, may fall asleep. Um, not uncommon to fall asleep afterwards. And the breathing it returns to normal um, at the end of that tonic phase. So during the clonic phase, actually, breathing is usually fairly normal. And here is an illustration of the tonic phase, which might show you why falling backwards is not unusual during the tonic phase um, and the clonic phase with the alternating uh, contraction and relaxation of large muscle groups. And here we have a, a video of a child <laughs> in the uh, clonic phase of a tonic seizure. If you can hear the, the barking, that is not the child, that is a dog in the room. Okay. The next kind of seizure that I would like to talk about is a, um, is a kind of generalized seizure that is a little bit different. It is called an absence seizure um, or petit mal seizure in the old termination. It is a seizure that generally occurs in childhood, um, often with familial, like inherited causes, although we haven't identified very many of the genetic markers that are associated with um, absent seizures. Um, but these children have brief loss of consciousness, but they don't drop. They don't lose muscle tone. Um, 
they just have a cessation of, of, of consciousness and motor activities briefly and repetitively. So they will suddenly appear blank and, and sort of stare into space. The attacks only last a few seconds. Um, and they can occur multiple, multiple times per day, up to a hundred time, uh, 200 times per day. Um, in kids who have uh, absent seizures, it is not unusual uh, for them to have um, to to have the seizures stimulated, but when they hyperventilate or by flashing lights, intermittent intermittent photic stimulation, it says here. On EEG, there is a characteristic pattern of generalized, so you see it across all uh, of the areas that are being monitored, generalized, three hertz spike wave um, uh, activity. So it's across both hemispheres and, and it's, again, it's brief because these last only seconds. Um, I would like to, let's see, show you, here's a, a video of a child doing his homework. Do it the way I show you, like this, you. And what's the person? And you see that he just loses consciousness, stares into space for a few seconds, and then he he comes out. He is not post ictal He's alert again and continues to do his homework. And I think that if you watch the rest, there's a, another seizure right here. So it just recurrent, brief seizures. Um, there are seizures that are simply tonic with a loss of consciousness and a continuous tonic muscle contraction, not those convulsions of a tonic clonic seizure. Um, people having generalized tonic seizures often quit breathing and so they may get cyanotic. Um, again, this can be a cause of falling down, of drop attacks, um, sudden loss of consciousness. Um, this EEG is just showing that it's generalized and it's a much faster um, activity as you might see there. It starts very abruptly. And then there are generalized clonic seizures with loss of consciousness, jerking of the musculature, but without that initial tonic contraction. Uh, these folks fall forwards instead of backwards uh, sometimes, but they can have drop attacks. This is a, um, ch a video of a child having generalized myoclonic seizures. So these are, whoops, hit the wrong button. But they're just having these shock like generalized contractions. They can be local or generalized. Had, that's some regular and there is a milk. specific <laughs> type of it's epilepsy so called juvenile myoclonic ep epilepsy, of which many of these kids have a family history, about a third. There is a type of seizure that is generalized called an atonic seizure. Uh, where sudden loss of all postural tone. So again, a drop attack, but without that uh, backwards muscle contraction that you see in a tonic seizure and without the jerking that you see in a clonic surgery uh, seizure. And this is most common in certain developmental disorders and the one that um, that we have illustrated, which is one of many potential um, seizure disorders that are syndromes in childhood, is Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, these kids have developmental delay, 
with cognitive deficits, they have typically different kinds of seizures. Um, and it is just one of many potential kind of devastating seizure disorders that occur in childhood. Um, you don't have to know any more about it than that. Um, there's another video here that you might want to watch about a family with a child with lennox Gasto syndrome. So I want to talk about making the diagnosis of epilepsy. Again, we need to get a good history from the patient. We need to get a good family history. We need to look at drugs because there are a ton of drugs that can lower the seizure threshold. Among the common ones are some penicillins, interesting, quinolone antibiotics, some psychiatric medicines like tricyclics and bupropion and lithium, um, some um, uh, local anesthetics including lidocaine, um, the uh, non-opioid or partial opioid agonist um, tramadol, um, there are a ton of drugs that can decrease seizure threshold. And so if you see somebody who's having seizures and who's on one of those drugs, it's something to consider. I'll tell you a brief story. I had a doctor who worked for me uh, in urgent care who was a recovering addict um, who had an agreement with the physician health program, you know, so we were very aware of what his issues were. And one day he had a seizure in the clinic and had to be transported to the emergency room. And what I came to find out after this happened, uh, when I, I went to the clinic and, and talked to the folks who worked there, was that he had been taking all of the tramadol samples. Ultram was a new drug then, and, and it was not controlled then, it is now. And, you know, the drug reps dropped off samples, and he was taking quite large amounts of tramadol um, without letting anybody know, without a prescription, and it triggered the seizure. So we had to let um, the emergency room know, we had to let the physician's health program know and it turned out it was a, a relapse um, and he was you know they weren't drug screening for tramadol back then um, but it was kind of a sad situation. Um, you also want to know about per potential toxic exposures. We certainly do a good physical exam with a complete neurological exam. Get some blood work, check a syphilis test, um, usually get an EEG, and that's usually going to be ordered by the neurologist. This is not, EEGs are really ordered by the primary care doc. Um, and you need to know that a normal EEG doesn't exclude the diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, if you don't catch the abnormal activity during a seizure, you may not find the evidence um, on an EEG when a seizure is not occurring. Um, we don't always image people with seizures, but when there are focal seizures or when seizures start after the age of about 25, we need to do an MRI to rule out a mass occupying lesion. CT is not the best study if we're evaluating epilepsy. It can be helpful after a seizure to check a serum prolactin level. This might be something you would do in the emergency room. And the reason is that prolactin levels often rise after seizures. And it may help you make the diagnosis of a seizure in somebody who has loss of consciousness. Um, it's helpful to look at thyroid levels. Uh, you're probably going to want to do an LP, look at um, cerebrospinal fluid. There are further um, studies that might be done and probably are more rarely done 
in cases where the diagnosis is unclear, uh, sometimes a study is done with a combination of EEG and video recording so that um, the symptoms can be correlated with brain activity. CT, not usually helpful. And the rest of these tests would be done relatively rarely. M M magnetic resonance spectroscopy, I certainly have never seen nor ordered. Um, positron emission topography, these would be ordered in specialized situations by the neurologist. Um, but sleep studies, polysomnography may be helpful when it is suspected that uh, somebody is having seizures during sleep. Whoops. Oh, that's right. This slide uh, is just showing you a um, EEG. Uh, you can see here that there are multiple electrodes that are being placed across the, the skull to record the electrical activity in both hemispheres of the brain. Um, and it can be very helpful in the diagnosis of epilepsy. Sometimes abnormalities are seen um, between seizures. Sometimes they are only seen during seizures. Now there are things that can cause seizures that look like um, epilepsy but aren't, um, or that look like uh, electrically caused um, conditions but aren't. And sometimes it's conversion disorder or somatization disorder. Conversion disorder, these are people who have a psychiatric disorder in which their psychiatric symptoms are manifested in physical um, manifestations. Um, somatization disorder is people who kind of think they may have seizures and, and they focus a lot on their physical potential symptoms. Factitious disorder, these are, are people who are kind of manufacturing the seizures um, and malingering their faking. Um, and in order to make that diagnosis of a non epileptic a non-epileptic seizure um, or a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, we look at a number of things. Um, we, we look at history at exam, we look at EEG, um, and we observe because people with um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure don't have the, the synchronized motor activity that you see in an epileptic seizure. They often vocalize, which people don't who are having real seizures. They typically aren't incontinent. They don't quit breathing and turn blue, and they don't demonstrate a post-ictal state. And this slide is again showing some of the, the differences between true seizures and pseudo seizures. Um, people having pseudo seizures don't bite their tongue, uh, which people having generalized um, tonic clonic seizures often do. Um, true seizures don't last very long, and again, those folks with true seizures have a post ictal period for generalized seizures. Um, they get hurt, which people with pseudo seizures protect themselves and they don't get hurt. Real seizures can occur at any time, day or night, so they can occur during sleep. Um, they can be, uh, they, they are not precipitated by a suggestion or by the patient getting angry um, or by somebody getting angry at them. And their, their EEG will be abnormal in a true seizure and no change in a pseudo seizure. So I said that a normal EKG doesn't rule out seizures, but a normal EEG during seizure activity does suggest a pseudo seizure and not, uh, not a real seizure. And, and folks with pseudo seizures do not respond to medication. Now I want to talk about status epilepticus. Um, so earlier it said 
an epileptic seizure lasting 30 minutes or more, but the, the definitions have actually changed because status epilepticus is a medical emergency that can result in irreversible brain damage from either um, hypoxia or from hyperthermia, elevated body temperature, or from the just kind of uh, uh, damage caused by the, the ongoing um, uh, electrical activity. So a seizure that persists more than five minutes without a spontaneous resolution um, is considered status epilepticus, or as I said earlier, multiple seizures without a return to consciousness. So this is something you might encounter if you're working in the emergency room. As I said, it is a true medical emergency. It requires treatment. And the treatment is um, multifaceted. First, we have to protect the airway. So these folks may end up needing to be intubated. But we need to medicate immediately um, to stop the seizure. And the initial medication would be benzodiazepines um, to uh, quiet brain activity, and generally that is done twice. Now, while we're medicating, um, we're doing other things. Certainly, we need to monitor vital signs, including temperature um, and pulse. We need to get blood work. Uh, we need to get an IV line. We need to give glucose because hypothermia can cause seizures. I mean, sorry, hypoglycemia can cause seizures. Um, get history as we can from family members or people who observed it, do a quick physical exam, get blood gases. Probably not going to be doing an LP during the seizure, um, but you are going to, as I said, give benzos, repeat benzos, follow that with an anti-epileptic drug if status epilepticus persists, usually phosphenituan, sometimes phenituan. And if the, the benzodiazepines and the anti-epileptic drugs do not cause a, a cessation of the seizure um, activity, we actually give these people generalized anesthesia. It is extremely important to keep them from getting very high body temperatures because um, fever can be a cause of seizure, but it can also be a result of the uncontrolled activity uh, that occurs during a seizure. This um, little kind of flow sh chart shows that we are giving the benzodiazepine and we're giving them quickly because they act quickly. Um, we have to obviously monitor uh, for respiratory depression and hypotension. Um, if um, this doesn't work, uh, we're going to give um, phosphenituan or phenytoin, okay? Um, if um, that doesn't work, we go to phenobarbital, and if that doesn't work, we go to general anesthesia. Okay, and here is another little flow chart showing acute management. Again, you know, we've got to support our um, ABCs, manage the potential for hyperthermia, give the glucose, thiamine, um, because glucose administration in somebody who's thiamine deficient uh, can cause brain damage and blood work. But very quickly, uh, drugs. So starting with um, lorazepam here or rectal diazepam if you can't get IV access. Um, if that works, uh, to apparently suppress the seizure activity, we get an EEG.
And the reason we get an EEG is to make sure that there is not continuation of status epilepticus without convulsions, which is non-convulsive status epilepticus. But if the convulsions persist, we go to phosphenituan. Um, if the convulsions cease, we get the EEG to rule out non-convulsive status epilepticus. If the convulsions persist, we go to phenobarbital um, or propofol, and we monitor at this point EEGs continuously. So um, it's important here to know kind of the I think the things that are important to know is that you need to medicate quickly, that it is an emergency, that the initial medication would be benzos, that the um, follow-up medication would be anti-epileptic drugs like phenytoin or phosphenytoin, that you need to monitor the EEG to rule out persistence of the status epilepticus without convulsions, that ultimately if you don't get a response to those drugs, we need to put the person to sleep with phenobarb, midazolam, or propofol um, and monitor their EEGs. Sometimes people with epilepsy or seizure disorders um, after a period of time on anti-epileptic medications, it's reasonable to consider withdrawing the drugs. Uh, in general, it's when somebody has been seizure-free for two to five years on adequate anti-epileptic drugs. And when we do this, we taper the drugs very slowly over at least six weeks. If the person is on more than one anti-epileptic drug, we taper the drugs one at a time. So slowly taper the first drug um, over six weeks, monitor to see if seizures recur. Um, if they do, put them back on that drug. If they don't, taper the second drug slowly over six weeks. Um, many kids um, and and even adults will be able to live without seizures, uh, depending on the cause of the seizures. So there are recurrences in about 20% of children and about 40% of drugs, and we have to uh, restart the anti-epileptic drugs and at that point continue them. There are some considerations um, around pregnancy and epilepsy. Anti-epileptic drugs, particularly some of the older ones that were um, enzyme inducers, um, carbamazepine and phenytoin both induce the CY or cytochrome P450 enzymes and, um, and increase um, homocysteine levels and decrease folate levels and therefore there was an increased risk of birth defects. Um, at, at this point, we know that the, the anti-epileptic drugs least likely to cause birth defects to be teratogenic are lamotrigine and levotir, I can't say that, levotiracetam. Um, we, in addition to the folate deficiency issues, topiramate is known uh, if used during the first trimester to be associated with cleft palate. Um, and obviously folate deficiency is closely associated with um, spina bifida and neural tube um, disorders. So if you have a patient of childbearing age who is on anti-epileptic drugs, they should probably be on folate um, supplementation uh, unless, you know, they've undergone a sterilization procedure or can't get pregnant. Um, but folate uh, supplements prior to conception are important in preventing birth defects. Um, if somebody with an epileptic seizure who has been seizure-free for a period of time wants to get pregnant, 
you can consider that slow taper over six weeks of their anti-epileptic drugs to see if they remain seizure-free. Um, do be aware that some um, anti-epileptic drugs, and particularly lamotrigine, um, drug levels decrease during pregnancy and, and the dose of the anti-epileptic drug may have to be increased in order to prevent seizures. This slide is just showing you um, the pages on which there are some medications and some side effects of anticonvulsant drugs listed. I don't expect you to memorize um, those tables, but I would like you to look at them. I do want you um, to realize that lamotrigine, which is uh, one of the newer anti-epileptic drugs, it's not an enzyme um, inducer. It does have an association, small association, but potential for skin problems, including Steven Johnson syndrome, early in its um, course, so it's something that would be important to watch. Um, but I want to talk sort of generally about how we um, prescribe for epilepsy. And, and basically, first, different anti-epileptic drugs work best for different seizure types. And so you certainly need to consider the seizure type when you're considering what drug to start somebody on. After that, think about things like potential adverse effects, um, interactions with other medicines. This is important when you, especially in people who have other conditions and in adults who might be on drug, other drugs. So drug interactions are important because many of these drugs are eliminated either by the liver or by the kidney, you want to consider comorbidities um, and use a drug that is uh, less likely to be complicated by hepatic or renal disease. Um, you want to consider age and gender and childbearing plans. So women of childbearing age, we, we might want to be more careful about um, using drugs that could cause birth defects. And lifestyle, um, here you might consider things like um, uh, occupation and whether uh, a drug that causes drowsiness is contraindicated for the patient's occupation and patient preferences. And then ultimately, because this is the real world, cost plays a role. Most, about half of the time, the first drug is going to work and, and we're done. If the first drug doesn't work and it's been titrated up to therapeutic levels, you can either add a second drug or change drugs. Um, in all cases, we make sure that we are reaching therapeutic levels. And if you add a second drug, it's a good idea to, to get that drug to therapeutic range before you taper the first drug. Some people end up needing two drugs. Um, most people with epilepsy, I think it said somewhere 80% uh, respond to monotherapy. Even if you've had to start a second drug and taper the first drug, most people end up doing well on a single drug. And there aren't a lot of, dr of trials on drug combinations. Hopefully over time there will be more. Um, but some people need to have more than one drug. I just have a couple of slides here um, showing you some of the, um, the, the mechanisms of action, some of the uh, potential side effects, um, good and bad, right? Um, so if somebody has migraine, you might want to use a valproic acid or gabapentin or, or topiramate. If you want somebody to lose weight, topiramate is, is helpful. These are 
uh, the drugs that induce enzymes in the liver. These are drugs that are secreted through the kidneys, right? So just some characteristics of the drugs and then their mechanisms of action. And these are some of the indications. Um, so for um, tonic-clonic seizures these days, I think lamotrigine is one of the most commonly used drugs. Um, for absent seizures, valproic acid and ethosuximide are common. And then there are there is a pretty long list of adjunctive drugs and backup drugs when other things are contraindicated or don't work. So in terms of prognosis, it's easier to control generalized seizures than partial seizures. Um, children who have epilepsy, and particularly absent seizures, um, who have remained seizure-free on um, appropriate anti-epileptic therapy, have a really good prognosis for withdrawing drugs and leading a seizure-free life. However, folks who have a structural lesion, so this could be um, uh, brain damage from trauma, from a stroke, from um, neurosurgery, from a mass, um, those people it's definitely harder to control their seizure disorder. Um, people who have a single um, unprovoked seizure, about half have a second seizure, at which point uh, we're going to be making that diagnosis of epilepsy because about 75% of people who have a second seizure will continue to have seizures. After 20 years, about half of the people who haven't taken drugs for five years are seizure-free. Um, about 20% um, remain seizure-free taking medicine and about 30% may ha continue to have seizures in spite of adequate doses of anti-epileptic drugs. The notes here say that 47% of people are controlled with one agent. I think it's actually more than that um, when uh, agents are tried appropriately and um, gotten up to therapeutic levels. But a few people need three or more drugs. It's important to understand that people with epilepsy often have concomitant psychiatric disorders. Um, lots of epileptics have mood um, disorders, including depression. Um, some have fairly rapid mood variations that are associated with their seizures. There is a much higher risk of suicide in um, people with complex partial seizures involving the temporal lobe. And then um, anxiety is common, you can imagine why, and psychosis uh, occurs fairly frequently in people with temporal lobe epilepsy. I mentioned earlier um, lifestyle issues. So one of the things that we have to think about in patients with seizures and epilepsy is what they do for a living. Um, and also things like swimming, which swimming um, solo would be a bad idea if you have an uncontrolled seizure disorder. Driving, a lot of these people really shouldn't be driving, can't drive um, until we can demonstrate um, that they are seizure-free for a period of time. Um, and, and they have to be careful about heights because falls from heights obviously can be um, devastating. And, and folks with um, generalized seizures who have drop attacks um, need to avoid situations in which they are putting their lives at risk. I want to talk just briefly about alcohol withdrawal seizures. Um, so people who are chronic alcohol users and who stop may have 
generalized tonic-clonic seizures, usually within about 48 hours of stopping their alcohol use. Um, they may resolve spontaneously, um, but if you see somebody who is a, an alcohol user having a focal seizure that is un likely to be related to alcohol withdrawal and we need to do another cause including probably an MRI imaging to look for something like a mass um, occupying lesion. And this slide is sort of in a funky place but just the description I've mentioned a post ictal state they occur after generalized seizures. They can be after generalized tonic-clonic seizures or tonic or clonic or atonic. They're a state of uh, confusion, being disoriented and drowsy that lasts for minutes, half an hour after seizure. Um, so that's this lecture. If you have questions, email me and I hope that you learned something.